Welcome to Taiwan Talks. I'm your host, Alex Lee. Taiwan's stock market is among the, one of the best performing markets in Asia. More precisely, Taiwan's market gained 26% versus India's 21% and South Korea 19%. With the background, a lot of concern about geopolitical. Taiwan market also very well known for its uh, internationalized in shareholder basis with uh, almost close to 40% of a total market capitalization held by global investors. In addition, Taiwan's small cap company are also proved to be the crown jewel to a lot of the emerging market small cap investors. So the answer holding TSMC is not the only solution for all of the global market investors. Today is our honor of having David O to our show. David is a portfolio manager and a partner at a US-based company, Times Square Capital Management. And particularly his fund, Times Square Emerging Market Small Cap was rated five star by Morningstar among many small cap investors and a fund in 2023. Particularly, he's a great performance and his interesting Taiwan roots make him the best candidate for the topic today. Welcome to the show, David. David, can you please introduce your company, uh, Times Square Capital Management, and the fund you're running? Sure, absolutely. So Times Square Capital, we have a history of about 20 years. Uh, we focus on uh, small and mid-cap stocks. And the reason we do that is because quite often we found that uh, a lot of the investors who focus on large caps often overlook these companies. Uh, these companies, uh, because they're, they are overlooked, often trade at more reasonable valuations. Uh, they are quite often run by management teams who have more of a significant stake in the companies. So in a certain way, they're also more aligned with shareholders because these management teams actually want to increase the value of these stakes. And we also find that the managers are much more involved in these businesses and quite often can grow faster uh, than many of the large caps. Uh, we have many strategies at our firm, including uh, a U.S. strategy, U.S. small and mid-cap strategies. We've got a global strategy, a global healthcare strategy, as well as an international and emerging market strategy. Uh, I'm, I'm with the emerging market strategy, but I also work with the international team as well. Uh, in terms of the emerging market strategy, this is an emerging market small cap strategy. Uh, so we look at, we look at uh, what's classified as emerging market small cap in uh, Asia, uh, as well as, let's say, uh, you've, got the, you've got India, uh, East Asia, which includes China, uh, most of Southeast Asia, as well as uh, Taiwan and Korea. You've also got South Africa, the Middle East, as well as Latin America and Mexico. Uh, that's pretty much my, my investment universe. Sure, great. Um, again, you and I, of course, you know this better that uh, Taiwan is uh, one of the like a key components of an emerging market. Actually, it's uh, got a fantastic performance, more precisely 26% of the gain uh, in 2023, right? Versus many other kind of great market. But again, uh, particularly with the backdrop of a uh, geopolitical concern, mm -hmm. right? Oh, can you share with uh, your sort of a strategy investing in Taiwan and uh, with the rest of the small cap, particularly in the other emerging markets? Sure, absolutely. So uh, one of the things that we really like about Taiwan is that uh, you've got a very well educated uh, population. You've got uh, fantastic infrastructure and by uh, infrastructure, uh, it's not just about uh, the roads, but I think it's also about connectivity with the rest of uh, not just Asia, but also the world. And you've already got uh, world leading industries, the most obvious one, which would be the, the semiconductor industry. Uh, what we've typically found though, is that it's not always just about one fantastic company and that's it. What's there is there's an ecosystem. So while I might not be uh, able to invest in TSMC, uh, all the other parts of the ecosystem that are in Taiwan uh, that are related to uh, that play a key part in uh, TSMC success. They're their partners, uh, their uh, stakeholders. They're other. They're all within uh, this ecosystem, and uh, that's where we get to play. 
And I think that, that this has, uh, for us anyway, we've found uh, numerous opportunities to still benefit from themes such as uh, AI, for instance. Uh, one area we found is Taiwan might be known or might be dismissed as an area where there's just, let's say, a lot of hardware plays, where you're just looking at a, some widget where it's just price times volume. Oh, these guys make it, but then, um, you know, it might be a connector or a small component of something, but when there's a downturn, then these guys suffer. What we've typically found is that there's actually a lot of higher value added companies that often get overlooked and are actually much more resistant to that kind of volatility uh, within the semiconductor space and actually play a really critical role. And uh, some of the, uh, I can't give specific names <laughs> just because I don't want to, <laughs> I, I don't want to seem as if uh, I'm trying to uh, pump my own portfolio, sure. but I can talk about certain themes such as, for instance, um, the ASIC design companies, sure. many of which the leading ones are Taiwanese. Yeah. And uh, what's, uh, what's fantastic about them is that they are the ones who are helping, let's say, the, the major players such as a Google or Amazon design application-specific chips uh, that are uh, much more, let's say they might not be a full GPU, but at the same time, these chips are much more economic, efficient, and produced in large quantities that then help uh, these cloud players, let's say, uh, focus on specific tasks such as large large language models or AI. Sure. And for us, that's um, that's it's been a uh, fantastic area to mm -hmm. find ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have there's also companies that hold certain types of IP that are foundation that are critical for uh, semiconductor development. Uh, again, these these companies this is, these are uh, just royalty earning companies essentially. So they don't really have very much in terms of uh, uh, of high cost, they're very asset light and hugely profitable. So from that perspective, we feel like, again, um, they might be small caps, but in our mind, um, the, the value that they add seems to be much, much, much higher than, um, than their market caps might imply. Mm, mm. Interesting. Just for the record, you, you probably so one of uh, 100 global investors told me nothing but TSMC. <laughs> <laughs> because the common conversation is always start from a, like a TSMC and ended by their concern about geopolitical, right? Mm -hmm. So let's talk about geopolitical. This is the fact and recognized by a lot of global investors, including uh, your investor of the fund yourself. And, uh, but funny enough that with that concern, but Taiwan still produce a great performance, right? How do you explain the risk to your investor and how how you handle uh, the risk in the portfolio and what's your overall take, how to interpret this, this uh, so-called like a, a non-fundamental risk into your day-to-day -day job? I think that's, uh, that's a fantastic question. It is a question that's very topical. I feel like it's become increasingly topical. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, I also uh, want to point out a couple of things that made that get me a little more comfortable or tell me that, um, you know, this is something that if, if it does become a, let's say, a very pressing risk or something that's much more an issue, it's something that can probably get noticed from, uh, of, with plenty of advance notice. Mm. Uh, it, when folks are talking about uh, an imminent invasion of Taiwan, for instance, I feel like the, the, uh, the, the kind of uh, force you might need is probably can be pretty pretty easily spotted from a while away if that ever comes to that. Um, but I'm also, and maybe I might get accused of being an optimist or, um, or, uh, or a dove in certain ways, but at the same time, I feel like the fact that we have not stopped uh, direct flights between Taiwan and the mainland, um, the fact that there's still plenty of, you know, e even if there's no official exchanges, there's plenty of unofficial exchanges or just even people-to-people -people exchanges uh, between the two straits that make me feel comfortable that, you know, hey, the fact that that's there, despite all the rhetoric, despite everything you might hear in the news, uh, you can still get on a direct flight from Taipei to Shanghai, tells me that this is something that um, at the end of the day, um, people on both sides of the strait want to do business. And um, on a personal basis, I think that um, uh, I, I think we, we, we all know people who, on both sides of the street, who are actually very, very friendly with each other. Um, and I would like to think that um, 
it, when when the folks on the other side um, talk about not really wanting to uh, fight a war, I actually think that looking at their history, um, fighting a war is, is especially an invasion. It's not something that's, that's happened in a very long time. And I think that they're well aware of uh, all the risks involved. And quite honestly, I, uh, I would probably go back to uh, one, of, uh, one of the key points that, that, uh, uh, that Swinza made. Oh, wow. Uh, when he said, um, you know, the, for them, it's uh, it, the, greatest, the greatest victories are those that are won without fighting. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's probably something that's, that's their preferred route. Mm -hmm. And uh, for us, I think that if there's still plenty of, uh, of opportunities and more exchanges between the two straits, I would like to think that that reduces the risk of conflict. Mm -hmm. I would like to think that if there were no exchanges, if, you just, if, there, were, if there were an end to the direct flights between uh, the, the, the two straits, if there, were, um, if, if there were even more bans on travel or exchanges, I would actually be a lot more worried. Wow. You know what? Uh, I couldn't help but think about, is that something reflect about your DNA, your, your, your blood? Because uh, you, your parents are obviously coming from a, uh, two very uncertain district in the region, right? South Korea from your, your father's side and your mom at the Taiwan side, right? That's right. That's right. Uh, talk about your, your family and uh, what's the impact on you? Uh, in a life, career, and maybe also investment decision. Yeah, no, so uh, just, just, just to give a little, little recap of, of my life, and hopefully this isn't something that, that, that bores people too much. Is, uh, so I'm actually, um, my mom is from Taiwan, uh, my dad is from Korea, and uh, I was born in Brazil. <laughs> so, um, and I grew up in, in the U.S., in, in Queens, New York. Uh, so um, my parents, uh, my mom, uh, my parents, my dad had immigrated to Brazil from Korea uh, after the war. I think there was a program to attract uh, labor to Brazil at, after the war. Uh, and my mom had uh, immigrated from Taiwan to, uh, to the U.S. Um, to, to work for a while. But then she met my dad, they got married, and they had made the decision to go back to Brazil um, to, to work for a while. And when me and my sisters were born, then they made the decision to uh, go back to the U.S. and, and raise us there. Um, we were uh, of very modest means. Um, my parents uh, ran, ran a shop. I helped them in the shop. Um, and thinking of, I think even back then I knew how hard my parents were working. Uh, and I, it compelled me to work hard as well, and it made me want to uh, make my family proud. Um, so uh, I, I worked hard to get into good schools, and uh, uh, Very I, good school, by the way. <laughs> Yale and Harvard Business School. <laughs> well, um, I mean, I, I, I just wanted to make my, my family proud. And uh, uh, you know, I, I can't, I can't uh, tell you how, uh, how lucky I feel that I get to... Um, uh, I, I love coming to Taiwan. Uh, I still have family and friends here. And being able to come here as part of my job, it just feels like a dream come true. I'm just like, just how, how awesome is that? So um, I, I think that that's, that's kind of uh, me in a nutshell. In terms of, uh, in terms of how it informs um, how I look at the, the region and emerging markets in general, I think that uh, one of the things that I've, I've come to appreciate is I think growing up with the background, understanding, maybe it, uh, maybe it gave me a, a deeper appreciation for uh, the values and the history, or it, or it sparked much more of an interest uh, in the region than uh, maybe I, I uh, otherwise would have had. Right? Growing up, I always, uh, I, st I still remember there was a comic book of, uh, of, um, of Chinese history that I stumbled upon when I was six or seven years old. And I guess it was one of those like, random little books that ultimately had a major impact of, on my life because then I would thumb through it and just say, Oh well, this happened, and it it was written in a kind of humorous way that you know appealed to kids, and uh, I think it led to more questions and more questions, and uh, wanting to uh, spark that curiosity. And I think that uh, what makes this job so enjoyable for me is that there's just so much learning involved. There's just so much wanting to be on the road, meet companies, learn what they do, meet people, 
and place that within the context of everything that's happening now. Because none of, none of what's happening now is just something that just, you know, we woke up and suddenly we're in the situation we find. It's, all, it's the culmination of a uh, long cycle of history in the region. Uh, and I, uh, I feel like, you know, it's one thing for us to uh, appreciate, let's say, a company like TSMC, but we also know that TSMC didn't just happen overnight. Right. Uh, we're, I feel like we, we know the story of, of Morris Chang. We know the story of a lot of other entrepreneurs and uh, or immigrants who then came back and uh, created great legacies. So that, I think that just having uh, just I think being a little more culturally aware, being able to speak the language uh, and being um, uh, and just under appreciating the, the context in which many of these great companies that are meeting have have arisen. I think it helps helps give me, uh, I, I always just feel like just give, having that extra understanding really helps me understand the companies a little more and understand our investments a little more as well. Sure, sure. Obviously, we need to zoom out a little bit because uh, you are not only investing in Taiwan. That's right. Because, <laughs> because your fund, uh, Times Square Emerging Markets uh, Small Cap Fund, uh, was rated like a five star by Morningstar, which amount like uh, many, many kind of uh, your competitors, right? Obviously, I hope that Taiwan is one of the major contributors, but obviously they got something else. It right? was. <laughs> can you, yeah, can you talk about uh, what made that great performance happen? Uh, again, of course, we shouldn't touch any specific name, mm -hmm. but overall, like top-down view, like a country distribution, and so on and so forth. Well, uh, I'd love to say something like, oh, the secret of my success is um, my good looks and my brilliant mind, but my mom <laughs> would say like, no, you have neither. Um, I would say that um, it, there's no secret sauce. I think at the end of the day, it's, it's hard work and it's hewing to uh, an, a disciplined investment process. That's part of our firm's philosophy. I think, um, I think joining, our, joining um, uh, Times Square and uh, getting, it, uh, getting, uh, I think getting it drilled into us in terms of the importance of following process and hewing to uh, how we look at companies and what, what we determine as quality growth companies uh, I feel like that does play a large role in terms of uh, the results we see. Mm -hmm. um, now, in terms of uh, in terms of um, what makes me excited about uh, emerging small caps, uh, emerging market small caps, is that um, there's a couple of things that 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 I've seen play out that uh, might surprise people a lot. When I when I say when I talk to people about emerging market small caps, it's a lot of them feel like it's just two layers of really big risks, right? One is emerging markets, which people feel like is risky as is, and then the other part is small caps, right? But then if you look at just the, e, the emerging market small cap index performance, not, not my, just, just the index itself, what you'll realize is that um, given where the world is going, uh, it's actually a, it, 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 for me, it's actually um, a, a fantastic way to think about um, what's, what's going on in the world and invest in uh, what I see are um, irreversible uh, trends that benefit this particular part of the market. And by that I mean, look, we all know that the world's trade flows and relationships are getting disrupted. And I wouldn't say that uh, countries are turning isolationist. I would actually just say that trade is just shifting to different ways. I don't think globalism is dead at all. I feel like it's actually a bit of a misnomer. I just think that trade is just being sorted into uh, different paths or different routes, but we are still a very globally linked uh, economy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think that um, what the beauty of, uh, if you looked at emerging markets in general, some China was 30 to 40% of the weight, or is still 30 to 40% yeah, of the weight. Still, yeah. um, Whereas in emerging market small cap, it's roughly the index itself. It's about eight to ten percent of the weight, uh, and what that means is that as folks are saying, okay, we're going to shift trade uh, away from China or diversify or uh, however you want to phrase it, what's happening is that a lot of the small caps that might have gotten ignored because mm -hmm. call it a few years ago, I think everyone was just focused on China um, in, within uh, within emerging markets now. Um, bright stars such as India, Indonesia, Mexico, um, these have a higher weight in the emerging market small cap. And these, these countries are benefiting from the flows, everything that's happening in terms of re the reorientation of, these, of trade and capital. So um, 
for me, this is, uh, this is an exciting time to be focused on this particular, um, this particular uh, part of uh, the, uh, the investment benchmark, for instance, emerging market small cap. Um, again, do, for a country like Indonesia to be benefiting from capital flows for places like uh, India, I feel like we can, we can spend all day about the, the full story there. So yeah. I feel like I don't need to spend very much time there. But for a, a lot of these smaller countries to actually be benefiting, to actually have, be creating manufacturing bases in what might have used to have been just more commodity producing nations or it's, this is a once in a gen generation uh, opportunity to move up the value chain create a uh, skilled labor force, create a real middle class. And I think that's part of what, uh, whenever folks talked about emerging markets, they were talking, well, there's gonna be the emergence of a middle class consumer. This is creating that middle class in these, these different markets. Mm -hmm. And the emerging market small cap benchmark is very well positioned to benefit from, from that change. Mm -hmm. Maybe you, you probably can elaborate a little bit detail in terms of your small cap in, a, in an emerging market invest strategy, because uh, say for example, uh, are you more focused like a company specific? So long you invest a good management, good company, but with a backdrop that uh, the liquidity flow and, uh, and also like a country risk or country distribution. Can you sort of a little bit more? Uh, what, yeah, what, what's yeah, the yeah. main sort of philosophy? Sure. Master. Sure. Um, we actually, um, we actually still cue to. We are actually very consistent in terms of what we look for in quality growth companies. When you have a management team that is uh, transparent, accountable, uh, and is very clear about what they're trying to accomplish, when you've identified a business model that uh, is, that delivers the kind of returns you're looking for, that can maintain its. Uh, that can maintain, um, help a company maintain its uh, competitive advantages. Uh, when you see that reflected in terms of its growth, I mean, I feel like uh, there's a lot of common characteristics that you find in uh, companies across the world sure. uh, that, that have these characteristics. Uh, with emerging markets though, we do, you, do have to keep in, you do have to think about um, the environments in which they operate a little more. Uh, so you have, I'm not a macro investor, but it is something that I have to be aware of in terms of uh, thinking about uh, potential risks such as currency risk. Um, you have to think about um, uh, things such as uh, what might be happen on, happening on the political front. Sure. Um, I mean, uh, Taiwan's uh, just one example. I, I think that, uh, it, thankfully, the, the election passed, uh, the election happened, and um, you know, it, I, it, there was a peaceful transition to power, as, as, as should happen in many democracies. Um, and I think that that's, um, that all comes into uh, part of uh, investing in emerging markets, uh, uh, period. Um, so I, I would say that that, that, that process, that, that, that um, uh, those investment consider that process is very much the same across the world, but then the investment considerations are a little different uh, in terms of keeping the, thinking about the macro mm. as well. That, that's not an easy job, particularly that, uh, uh, nowadays, kind of a equity investment getting taken over by ETF, taken over by like a quantitative one. Uh, do you consider your kind of particular approach is how you gain the additional performance, particularly in the emerging market? Yeah, actually, I think that what's what's also interesting is that uh, on the EM small cap side, you have, uh, I feel like uh, you actually have a lot more uh, opportunities for outperformance. Again, I think it's also because a lot of the, uh, the passive ETFs might be more focused on the large cap. Large cap, yeah. Right? Uh, I think that there's, there's special factors within small cap that make them more unique or give you opportunities to find gems that, um, that uh, aren't, as, um, aren't as subject to, let's say, passive flows or other factors. You can't ignore the, the impact, though. They're, 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 they're definitely, you can still feel the impacts in some places, but I feel like it's... it's um, less reflected in emerging markets small cap. We do find, for instance, uh, uh, within India, this is still a place where you, still, you can still find, um, if you work hard enough, if you meet enough companies, you'll say uh, these small caps can really uh, outperform in uh, different, different kinds of, let's say, uh, uh, different kinds of uh, market backdrops. And it, it, finding companies like that is, uh, is simply, uh, simply a joy in terms of saying, I did the work on this, this company, 
I've met the management team, and um, you know, if, when 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 the market does find uh, uh, does kind of come to come to basically the same conclusion. Uh, I mean, you know, of course you, you've done well in the stock, but there's also, I guess, a, a little bit of a um, intellectual reward as well in terms of saying like, phew, I guess uh, it's nice to be right. But I'm also wrong plenty of times too. I'll, I'll I have, to, have to admit. Yeah, yeah. Again, this is uh, the second time I met you here in Taiwan in the last six months, mm -hmm. right? Obviously that uh, you're here, not just for the interview, but also visit other company. Uh, look behind like a 2024. Right, and of course, 2024. Mm -hmm. Do you have any particular kind of a view about Taiwan in the context of the overall kind of emerging market? Uh, just general view. What, what do you What do you feel after this a short trip here in Asia? No, I actually feel really encouraged, and I think that it's not. Uh, I I don't want to say that you know. Oh, hey, I'm I'm betting on um, uh, certain, let's say, a certain macro factor or certain currency or anything like that. I think it's more. Uh, just the the companies I meet, how excited they are about the opportunities ahead of them, uh, and I feel like this is something that maybe becomes a lot more apparent uh, on the small cap side. As in, um, just thinking, just talking, you're you're meeting with the the people who are driving investment decisions on behalf of the company or making strategic decisions on behalf of the company, and I feel like it's always a, a bit invigorating. Uh, and it, this, this trip wasn't just about Taiwan, it's also about other parts. Uh, I was in Shanghai, Shenzhen, Hong Kong as well. And I think it's um, still getting to the same thing in terms of meeting management teams, asking them um, about uh, how they're looking at the situation. And it's, it, it's, it's just a, um, it, it's, it makes this job really rewarding and really fun. Sure, sure. Again. I bet that every time you probably stay over with some of your families here, here in Taiwan. Oh, by the way, you do the language. You speak Mandarin very well. Oh, better than that. Trust me. <laughs> and, and what Taiwan means to you? Again, I was a professional, right? Uh, I know you travel when you were young, you kids, you travel. Uh, quite regularly, maybe the summer tied to Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Can you share with us your fond memories about Taiwan in life? Gosh, um, so there were, uh, I don't know, hopefully this doesn't seem uh, too inappropriate, but there is a, I don't know if it's still around, but there's a program called Love Boat in Taiwan. Love Boat, yes, Hualien. <laughs> All right, and I don't know how, I don't know how exactly it happened, uh -huh. but my mom somehow enrolled uh, me and my sisters, when we were, call it, 8, 10, and 12, 12, no, no, it was, it was like 6, 8, and 10, uh, into the Love Boat program. And basically, uh, we were the youngest kids and what were basically all these other, other kids. Taiwanese American teenagers. Okay, okay. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, we were, we, it, it, we were just completely kind of, uh, uh, I guess, like the, <laughs> what the hell are these kids doing here kind of thing, right? Um, but at the same time, it was uh, it was a lot of fun because uh, that was uh, that we got to spend uh, a long period in Taiwan. Uh, we did make fun. We did make um, uh, we did have a lot of fun, like going bowling, in particular with uh, with a lot of the um, the older kids. They took us under our wing, and you know I, I think we all had a laugh about it. But um, my friends still find it incredibly weird that, you know, this, this love boat program, which <laughs> they view as like kind of like just this, uh, this kind of uh, dating thing for, for uh, basically high school and, and up uh, uh, Taiwanese teenagers, that these kids just ended up saying, oh, hey, what are we doing here? So I want to be there. Obviously, I went to the wrong kind of love boat kind of a trip. <laughs> well, I'm, if uh, if you saw us there, I'm sure you'd be like, "Oh, hey, uh, kick these kids out! What the yeah. heck?" Yeah. So yeah, again, um, again, you you obviously that's part of your Taiwan's memory. But again, you visit a lot of a Taiwanese small cap kind of CEO and management, right? Yes. Uh, and then we change all different kind of view about those uh, those managers. They are great. Do you have any advice you can share with uh, small cap? CEO here in Taiwan, what they can do to better? I think that they can definitely um, do a, a lot more outreach. I think that they can definitely be a lot more, uh, make a little bit more of an effort to 
uh, meet with uh, investors, uh, particularly uh, outside of Taiwan. Yeah. I think that, um, number one, that uh, they, um, they, they, might, uh, they might pick up some good advice here and there every so often. But I think that it, it's also, uh, I think it's important for them to highlight the value and the competitive advantages that they have, because sometimes um, it, the market might uh, overlook overlook them otherwise, and I feel like it's it's a bit undeserved, right? They, it's all a matter of them just being out there a bit. Uh, but the other thing too is more there's you know I think uh, Taiwan's made a lot of great strides in terms of uh, these companies have made a lot of great strides in terms of uh, being more transparent. Um, one thing that always surprises not just me but a lot of my teammates or uh, other investors meet is just how a lot of these Taiwanese companies, um, it's not always that they focus on it, but then in terms of metrics such as return on invested capital, return on equity, they just end up uh, doing really well, uh, scoring really well on those metrics. So um, I think that, I think that uh, a lot of these Taiwanese companies, if, uh, if, you, if they were just to get out there a little more, I feel like they would find a very, very receptive audience. Yeah. And maybe some companies might need to find either a translator or, um, you know, they uh, just have someone like yourself <laughs> uh, uh, introduce uh, these companies a little more. Yeah. Um, uh, honestly, you've, you've done us a huge, huge favor in terms of uh, introducing us to so many great companies. I really have to thank you for that. Um, I think that, that um, you know, these, these companies would, uh, would have a lot to learn, but they would also have a lot to teach as well. Great. They are transparent. They are hardworking. They just need to speak up. That's right. And make them more visible, particularly to the global investors. Yeah. Well, you know, we just uh, have a very successful kind of election. Whatever you like, but we have got a new kind of pre president uh, elect, right? Now, William Lai is our new president elect, right? Uh, again, do you have uh, any view or you, you, you want to share with a uh, the, the future present lie anything from your perspective? I uh, number one, I, uh, I I congratulate him, um, but I would also like to point out that um, you know if uh, on the one hand, uh, if you read Western newspapers, you might say, oh look, he he won again, um, widespread support. But I feel like uh, talking to the folks here, uh, they'll point out actually. Um, he won 40% out of uh, 100. Yeah. The other two parties were split. And, the, and Taiwan seems would be much more divided. It seems much more divided than um, you know, many of the, let's say, Western uh, newspapers might, might either admit or, or, or perceive. So what I would tell him, or what I would, and again, I, I can't, <laughs> I'm, I, I still have to recognize uh, my role as, as someone who's coming from outside Taiwan, but I would like to think that uh, there's a lot more work to be done to uh, address uh, a lot of the concerns from that divided electorate, right? I think that, um, you know, I think some of the common things I hear about are, um, you know, for especially if you're uh, younger, um, maybe a feeling that, that there could be more done to help support um, the young here, I feel like there's, uh, it, it always alarms me at, you know, kind of, let's say, like the low birth rate and um, uh, maybe the frustrations in terms of people want to form families, people want to be able to buy a house. And I feel like th these, are, these are concerns that we, can, we hear all over the world, but I feel like um, Taiwan's, uh, if, if, uh, if the president or other members of the government can do something to, to address a lot of those concerns, um, that, that, that might be a big step in terms of helping to pull people together. And I also think that, uh, you know, there's, uh, uh, Taiwan is a rapidly aging society, and I think that, you know, the concerns of the old need to be heard as well. It's not just about the young, but also about the old as well. I think everyone, it's, Taiwan's not immune from any of the domestic problems. And I think that the other thing about this election or, is that there was much more of, uh, uh, much more, uh, I feel like, um, uh, attention being paid to domestic issues. And I hope that that's something that the, the government recognizes as something that, that should be worked on. Sure. It's not just about cross straits issues, sure. it's about domestic issues as sure. well. Uh, insightful kind of sharing. I bet that uh, we're coming back again. Uh, I'm more than happy to introduce some of the real good young risk taker from entrepreneurship kind of a circle. Anyway, thank you for your time. Thank you so much for having me here. Yeah, David. Really nice. appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah.